Welcome to Sucks to Your Asmar. As many of you know, the phrase comes from William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies. The character Piggy's constantly complaining in the novel about his asthma. He one time says that he can't swim because of his asthma. Ralph, the protagonist, responds, Sucks to your asthmar, Piggy. Now, Ralph represents a commitment to civilization in this novel. He fights barbarism. He represents order, civilization, and productive leadership. Sucks to your asthmar is something I like to say to people who are needlessly complaining about trivial things. Ooh, well, I've noticed that uh, your workplace does not have any um, transsexual lesbian people of uh, color. Sucks to your asthmar. I find that hairstyle very offensive. It's a cultural appropriation. Sucks to your asthmar. Well, why, why can't I take my grenade launcher into McDonald's if I want to? I should be able to take my grenade launcher into McDonald's. Sucks to your asthmar. You know, why is my professor not recognizing me as a mythical unicorn in 17th century chaotic good dragon she beast? Sucks to your asthmar. This podcast is brought to you by PetHats.com. I've got a lot of great friends who are pet lovers. Their pets are like part of their family. Now, the upside to that is you get a lot of companionship, love, and affection from your pet. The negative thing about that is most pets don't live as long as human beings. So you're going to witness your pet passing away. This can be devastating to people. I've seen friends go through it, and it's not pretty. But PetHats.com has a solution. When your pet passes away, keep them in the family. Do them the honor of turning them into fabulous headgear. Turn them into a baseball hat. Turn them into a fashionable Sunday hat. Turn them into an everyday duster. It doesn't matter. PetHats.com does it all. Here are some of my friends with testimonials about PetHats.com. Princess and I used to love the Iggles. Well, we'd go down to the park every Friday. Sometimes on the weekend, we'd go down the shore together. Uh, when she passed away, I didn't know what to do. PetHats.com helped me. They turned her into a fabulous cat. Looks like an eagle. Now when I go down the stadium, Princess comes with me. And she gets so many compliments from my friends and just people. Thank you, PetHats.com. I was quite skeptical when PetHats.com asked for the skin and bones of my beloved Rex, but I said I'd give it a whirl since it was a gift from my wife. Now, he's a Doberman. He's a big doll. I'm involved in a certain organization where we wear top hats. Now, they made me one of the best-looking top hats I've ever seen. And right on the top of that top hat is Rex's head. Now, you might think that doesn't work, but it does. It brings tears to people's eyes, how beautiful it is. I recommend PetHats.com for any of your hat needs. Now, I've seen some of these hats in person, and let me tell you, they are top flight. The cat's meow. Your pet doesn't even have to be dead yet. You can call now and order at today's prices in a year, five years, ten years down the road. You can have that hat made at today's prices. You can't beat that. So call PetHats.com now. What made America for so long a beacon to the rest of the world was possibility. It was a place where one was free to imagine and strive. America was better then, better than the place you were coming from. No matter its faults, it was more accepting, safer. There was more opportunity, more possibility. Our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents came because America was better then, if they didn't come on a slave ship. They had hope of making a better life, of becoming something they couldn't become in the place they left. They were searching for something it was better than. My friend's father came to America in the 1970s. He was leaving a country where a, a war had broken out. And he said at the time his only choice was which state to, in America to go to. Now he's gone back to his country, it's calm again, and the war has passed. But he said he would not now choose to come to the United States. He would go somewhere else because of how far the United States has fallen just since the 1970s. It's no longer better than. Why is that? Well, I think a big part of that has to do with 
dogmatism. America's become a nation full of dogmatists and fanatics. Now, I think the important question to ask is how. To me, it's quite plain. The blame lies with multiculturalism or the idea of multiculturalism. A lot of people might have a knee-jerk reaction when one says that multiculturalism is a negative force. But that might also be because they don't quite understand what they're saying when they say multiculturalism. A lot of people, when they refer to multiculturalism, are really referring to pluralism. The difference is, in multiculturalism, there is no dominant culture. In pluralism, there is a dominant culture that everyone else is allowed to participate in and bring their own ideas to. The helpful professor.com says the difference between cultural pluralism and multiculturalism is that a culturally plural society has one dominant cultures. Other cultures can coexist as minority cultures peacefully. They can continue to practice their own culture. A multicultural society has no dominant culture. All cultures intermingle and practice their own cultural traditions peacefully. There's no single hegemonic cultural group in the society. Now, the problem with this is that the idea of multiculturalism goes against what works. It goes against human nature. Eventually, you're going to have what's happening in the United States, and that's a struggle for the dominant culture. It's a struggle to see who defines what it means to be American. What do we believe? What do we not believe? Who are we as a people? One culture is always going to try to decide that. And furthermore, a successful culture needs those parameters. Now, the United States used to be a pluralist society. You were free to go to the United States as long as you adhered to the norms and values of what it meant to be American. As ex-German Chancellor Angela Merkel said in a 2010 speech, multiculturalism leads to parallel societies and therefore remains a life lie or a sham. Five years earlier, in 2010, she said, of course the tendency has been to say, let's adopt the multicultural concept and live happily side by side and be happy to be living with each other. But this concept has failed and failed utterly. Because we're attempting to replace our pluralist society with a multicultural society, we've lost our guiding principles. Now, prominent political scientist Harold Laswell defines politics as who gets what, when, how, where, and why. Who has the right to vote? Should women be allowed to drive cars? Do we chop off the hands of criminals? Is the death penalty morally just? We need a set of shared beliefs to function as a society. We need a dominant culture. And many who believe that multiculturalism is the answer or what we should be striving for are taking our values as the default setting. But anyone who's traveled around the world knows that our values are not the default setting. So what has been the dominant culture in pluralist America? Well, it can be called several things. It can be called white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, as it has been in the past. But what we're really talking about are enlightenment values. A few of the core tenets of enlightenment values are deism, liberalism, republicanism, conservatism, toleration or tolerant pluralism, and scientific progress. Deism strives to understand God's existence as divorced from holy books, divine province, revealed religion, prophecy, and miracles. It's based on religious belief of reason and observation of the natural world. Deists appreciate God as a reasonable deity. Liberalism was another central ideal to American Enlightenment thinking. It's the notion that humans have natural rights and that the government authority is not absolute, but based on the will and the consent of the governed. Classic republicanism is a commitment to the idea that the highest, the state's highest public official should be elected rather than uh, a hereditary right. Conservatism is about conserving the ideals 
of Enlightenment tradition. So, for example, when many thought the French Revolution went too far, they believed that these ideals had to be conserved. And, of course, scientific progress was about slang dogmatism and believing in rational, observable things. Now, this wasn't about atheism, which many neo-atheists are also dogmatists. It was about things you can observe and finding God through science, not revelation. To many, these ideals may seem like the default setting or self-evident, but that's only because you've been raised in those traditions, and your parents and grandparents were probably raised in those traditions. These are not the default settings, and these do not exist everywhere on earth. As we shift away from a culture based on rational thought, reason, intellectual reasoning, conversation about ideas, what fills that vacuum? Well, it's dogmatic beliefs. And although we may think of religion and dogmatism going hand in hand, it was originally in America the Protestant thinkers who were for Enlightenment ideals, who were for an accepting pluralism and for rationality and reason and scientific progress. For a long time in American politics, this was also the battle cry of the left. The left represented Enlightenment values. And just as the French Revolution went too far, today's left has gone too far. It's the left, not the right, that's become driven by intolerant dogma. We know the truth. You believe like us or you're wrong. Gone are the Enlightenment values that said we need to observe the universe, observe nature, and that's going to give us truth. Now, the left will tell you there is no truth. There are only social constructs. It's gone so far as to cancel out natural order, to deny that a natural order of male and female exists. Now, this is a rabbit hole we can go down for hours and hours, and I, that's, that's not the purpose of this podcast. The purpose is, first, to see how we turned into a nation of dogmatists and fanatics on both sides, and second, why that matters, and third, what can we do about it? So domestically, why does it matter that we're now relying on dogmatism, especially on the left? And it's very ironic that the left is now more dogmatic than the right. And one of the reasons that the early Enlightenment thinkers were against dogmatism was because it didn't allow them to solve problems. Dogmatism doesn't solve problems. Dogmatism doesn't allow for truth. Tishnat Han said that the Dalai Lama said that as soon as you believe you know the truth and you stop searching for the truth, then you will never know the truth. So the, orig the original Enlightenment thinkers put down dogmatism in order to search for truth. Now in America, we've put down the search for truth and solutions and picked up dogmatism. Domestically, this is important because if we are dogmatic in our beliefs, we can't solve our problems. We can't even talk about facts anymore. For example, if I say that 45% of Americans' prison population is African-American, but they only make up 13% of the population, people are going to get angry. Or they're going to offer up dogmatic answers as to why. It's institutional racism. African Americans are more violent. This is a huge problem in America. Why? And we're not going to get answers by offering up dogmatic solutions. How much is institutional racism? How much is from a legacy of racism and slavery? How much of it is the fault of an African American urban culture that praises drug dealing, murder, guns, violence? How much of it is the fault of an inescapable cycle of poverty? We don't know. You don't know because we can't investigate and offer real solutions because people will get angry, because people have know that they know the truth. Another crucial issue in America is the problem of gun violence. And again, we offer up dogmatic answers to a complex problem. So we know the truth. Oh, if you take away guns, then only criminals are going to have guns. We need to get real answers. And it's not going to happen with dogmatism. We need to embrace our culture, our enlightenment values, and ask the tough questions, and dig, and look at things that might make us uncomfortable, and accept truths that might go against our entrenched beliefs. It's the only chance America has domestically.
on an international scale, it's more important than ever that America and the West harkens back to its Enlightenment traditions. We have the rise of China and Russia. These societies are not based on Enlightenment traditions. Right now, Russia goes by the law of might makes right. Vladimir Putin recently threatened South Korea. He accused South Korea of selling weapons to Ukraine. Now, South Korea has denied this and said they are only giving humanitarian aid, food, and medicine. And they said they can't control what third parties do with weapons that are sold. For example, they sold weapons to Canada, South Korea did, and Canada may have sold them to Ukraine. Now, Vladimir Putin said, how would South Korea feel if North Korea was set free and attacked South Korea and Russia supplied North Korea with weapons? Vladimir Putin is clearly threatening South Korea. He's clearly threatening the rest of the world. Now, there's also been a recent development, a very interesting recent development in China, and this is something we should be paying attention to. Xi Jinping has been elected basically now as president and chairman for life. No one has had this power in China since Mao Zedong. This is important because he had opposition in China, and he has now eliminated that opposition. In his address, Xi Jinping made clear that war is not out of the question and is to be prepared for and expected. He also made it clear that it's time to usher in the new era of Marxism globally. There's nothing more antithetical to Enlightenment ideals and traditions than authoritarianism. And we now have on the world stage the rise of authoritarianism. And in China, it's not just the rise of Marxism and authoritarianism. It's also the belief in China that China is the center of the world, that China is the originator of all civilization on Earth. After the 1989 uprisings in China, they changed their policy from a Maoist policy, which this, the central figure was Marxism, to a Chinese policy, one of Chinese greatness, of Chinese reclaiming its place on the stage. And central to that push was re-education. So people were sent to re-education camps and an overhaul of the Chinese education system, which placed China's greatness as the core curriculum in schools. And not just China's greatness, but China's need for revenge, for that brief moment in history, that hundred years in history where China fell, where China was abused by Western powers. It was a fluke. China needs to prove again that it is the greatest nation on earth, that all civilization comes from China. They even claim now that life originated in China, not in Africa. This is not propaganda that the Chinese people buck off and laugh at. This is Chinese culture. This is the operating system of the Chinese people. Just as our operating system has been Enlightenment ideals, their operating system is Chinese greatness, China as the center of the world. And they will take that to be the default operating system, just as we have taken for granted that Enlightenment ideals are the operating system. We can't make the mistake of believing that these ideals are universal. I've been to China, and I can assure you that these ideals are not universal. There's a saying in China that if you hit someone, you should hit them and kill them rather than hit them and wound them. Because if you hit them, and only wound them, you could be forced to pay reparations to them for the rest of their lives. If you hit a 30-year-old man and you damage his leg, you might have to pay him for the rest of his life a certain fee every month. This has led to a rash of killings in China, where people might tap someone with their car, but rather than pay them for the rest of their life, they run over them three, four, five times in order to kill them. This has happened with children. There was one especially egregious case where grandparents were walking with their three-year-old child, and the child was knocked over by a car. The child was fine, not hurt at all. The car began to reverse, and the grandparents started screaming, no, 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 no. The car ran over the child once, twice, three times. The driver of the car got out of the car and got into the passenger seat, and the passenger got into the driver's seat, and they offered the grandparents money and said, please don't say that my husband was driving. 
he doesn't have a license. Now, the point of this awful story is that human life, the value of human life, is not a universal tradition. It is not the default setting. We like to imagine that it is, but violence is the default setting. Violence is the norm. Violence is the natural setting. Might makes right is the natural setting. In the Habesian state of nature, if you want something from your neighbor, you go ahead and you go over and you cut the neighbor's head off and you take it. Now we've made social contracts so we don't live in chaos, so we don't live in violence, but there are many places on earth that do live by the code of might makes right. We have honor killings. People are stoned to death. That's not what we want for America. That's not what we want for the world. So we give up our right to commit violent acts. And we give the state a monopoly on violence. Now we need some measure of violence. If a crime is committed, if someone breaks into your house and the police come and say, stop stealing that stuff, what makes that person stop? Well, it's a threat of violence. It's the threat that they'll be taken away in handcuffs. It's a threat that the police may shoot them. Violence upholds the law. Violence also upholds international order. As terrible as that may be, that is the reality. What is going to stop an autocratic China and Russia who believe that might makes right, who believe that their system is the right system, who believe dogmatically in Marxism, who believe that China is meant to rule the world. What is going to stop them? In my mind, there are two things. One is war. Some political scientists and those who specialize in international relations say that we have already entered a third world war. And if we haven't, we soon will. We have definitely entered a new cold war. And where are the fault lines? Where are the battle lines drawn in this cold war? I think our only chance for a nonviolent resolution both in America and on an international scale, is to hearken back to our Enlightenment traditions, our values, the value that people are created equal, the value that everybody has a right to life, the idea that we're free, that we're born free, that we're free from dictators and kings. We don't live in tyranny and fear that someone's going to come and take us away in the night because of something we said or something that our neighbor said that we said. This is reality. This is real. I was talking to a group of old people in Korea, and they said you had to know which answer to give during the Korean War and after if you wanted to survive. If someone asked if you were a communist or not, you better give the right answer, because if not, you'd be executed on the spot. Another person asked if you were communist, you better know who they are and give the right answer, or you'll end up executed. This is reality. This is what happens when we stray away from enlightenment values, when we stray away from the idea that truth is not dogmatic or absolute, that human lives don't have value, that there's more value in an idea, that ideas are worth dying for. Mao Zedong killed a hundred million people in China. Joseph Stalin, 50 million in the Soviet Union because of dogmatic beliefs. America may be headed in a similar direction. We can't be ruled by fanaticism and dogmatism. And we can't allow dictators driven by dogmatism and fanaticism to take over the world.